Well, hello. I am back at work, as you can see. Uh, chances are I will not be able to upload this at work, but uh, next time I go into town, which may not be for a while, I'll attempt to do so. And uh, uh, suffice to say, without being super specific, uh, work has been interesting. Um, basically, while I was driving out here, and it's it's a uh, almost two thousand mile drive from my house to where I work. Uh, I was almost here, and I got a call, and basically there was a. Oh, I don't know what you call it, an attempted coup d'etat. The management of the company I work for basically split. Uh, they had an acrimonious um, parting of ways and uh, were basically, one one was going to leave and start his own company. And this concerned me, concerned me because they both wanted me to work for them. And uh, Suffice to say, it was an interesting couple of days. Uh, basically, both of them were trying to swoon me and the guy I'm working with because uh, they need us to do the job. We're working for a company that wants me and this other guy working here, at least for now. And whoever could convince us to be with their company would get the work, basically. And... Uh, Although it could have gone any number of ways, including me just losing a job or you know, not having a job, uh, as it turned out, I ended up getting a lot of money. I got a raise, uh, I got a whole bunch of money in the bank, and uh, it ended up being good, at least so far. And I think it's interesting, uh, it is an anecdote that's absolutely true, but I think it's interesting because it illustrates a fallacy uh, that I think permeates a lot of thinking, and especially a lot of Marxist and socialist thinking. Um, you know, when I talk to socialists, a lot of times um, they have all these uh, preconditions, these uh, assumptions, and if these assumptions were correct, you know, their conclusions might make some sense. Uh, so, for instance, if the labor theory of value was not ridiculous, you know, then the exploitation of the workers would be manifest, but the labor theory of value is ridiculous. And so, uh, one thing I hear a lot of socialists say, or at least maybe not in, a, in a, one particular phrase, but they seem to view uh, employers, capitalists, as having an undue uh, advantage to the point that workers are basically helpless uh, pawns. Uh, I had a long dialogue with a socialist who referred to this as dictatorial power. And there's the adage, you know, work for a boss or starve. Uh, and this is blatantly false. Uh, I'm not to say that as an as a employee or as a worker, you have some kind of amazing power to get whatever you want from your employer. But employers and capitalists have to have workers you know if you have a if you have land that's good for agriculture it's not like you open your door one day and there are going to be uh, you know, bushels of produce just lined up ready to go and uh, customers coming you know begging to pay for them you're gonna need to work to produce that and I don't care if it's a farm or a factory or a telemarketing company or whatever you need workers to come and make it happen otherwise it's going to be idle and it's going to waste if you have a factory without laborers it was wasted if you spend a billion dollars on a factory and then don't hire anybody then you have just wasted a billion dollars and if you're lucky when you sell it to somebody else you might get your money back but in all likelihood you'll get far less of your money back so you have to have workers and so uh, although my story could have ended in any number of ways, if employers really had dictatorial power, it could not have ended the way it did. You know, if my boss could just tell me, listen, I'm telling you that you have to work for me and you can't work for somebody else, then he never would have had any uh, reason at all to pay me a raise, to give me a bonus, anything. Uh, 
you know, I remember a lot of times when you debate socialists, they'll say things like, you're just trusting the capitalists to be nice and to be uh, altruistic. Um, certainly not. I mean, there are nice altruistic capitalists out there, I'm sure. I haven't met too many, but uh, no argument I've ever made or free market advocates, at least the ones that are, you know, worth reading, uh, ever depends on the uh, goodwill or good intentions of the capitalist or the employer, which I would say is a marked c contrast with any kind of command economy, because in a command economy, whoever is doing the commanding, you have to have be an angel, otherwise you're going to have despotism, which, as it turns out, is what you always end up with. Uh, neither of the people who wanted to hire me are altruistic. They're both... I don't think they'll ever see this video, but they're not altruistic, let me just say that. Uh, they are extremely self-interested, as are all people, blatantly so. And they have many character flaws. And they're not helping me because they're a nice guy. They're helping me because they need me. All right, And it's not because I'm the most skilled, amazing person. They need somebody who knows the job. And this is another thing socialists don't understand, is they talk about labor like it's a homogenous blob, just like they talk about capital like it's homogenous homogenous blob. And this is interesting for people who laud, you know, uh, it's interesting for people who laud the working class. I guess it makes sense that they're collectivists, that they would view an entire class of people, indeed all people, as, you know, more or less interchangeable. But this is not the case. The work that I do, I mean, people understand at some level their specializ specialization, you know, and the most obvious examples are if you need a doctor, you can't just hire some random person. But I think it goes much deeper than that, because even the most unskilled jobs uh, do not are not uh, doable by everybody. You know, there are doctors in the world who would not make good fast food employees. I mean, most doctors probably could if they wanted to, but many of them wouldn't have the right demeanor, you know, or they wouldn't be willing to do the necessary work. And that's just one example. You know, of all the people in the, in the world. Not all of them can do even the simplest tasks. So there isn't, you know, they say, they always seem to think that, well, they can do whatever they want. They can fire you. They can pay you nothing because they can always replace you with another worker. The thing is, is you're not so easily replaceable. Uh, and there's something called opportunity cost. They can offer you nothing. I mean, even if we didn't have a government, my boss could say, I'll pay you a penny a day, and I'll say, bye. Like, I'd rather just live on a, you know, subsistence farming for a penny a day. But I can get a better job doing something else than I will, and he has to take that into account. My boss, I know, <coughs> he cannot hire people less than a certain amount because they will get that same amount someplace else, and it's a lot. It's a very decent wage. I don't, I don't like sound like a millionaire or anything, not that, but like it, there's no government mandated minimum wage in what I do, but the rates are far, far, far above that. Uh, and that's because people can go and do other things. If you're going to pay them less, they'll just do other things. So, uh, like I said, my story is an anecdote, and I could very easily have lost my job, uh, but I've seen it many times. Even when I was working in fast food, you know, there were several occasions where people would go and say, I'm going to quit unless you give me a raise. And if, if employers had the omnipotent power that socialists um, demagogically claim that they do, then they would be able to just say, screw you, we're not giving you a raise, we're going to pick, cut your pay. But uh, many times, not every time, but many times they will. And I know when I worked at fast food, every time I quit, which was never because of anything bad, just because I would be going to school or whatever, uh, they would come back and they'd ask me to stay and they'd say, if you come back, we'll give you a pay raise. Uh, why would they do that? Because they need workers. All right. If you have a fast food restaurant without workers, let alone efficient, good workers, then you're losing money. All right. This goes back onto I, a lot of people just imagine capital or things like capital and land are basically their own reward. They just generate prosperity. This is, of course, false. Uh, that requires entrepreneurship and labor. It requires people to think, how, what's the best way to use this equipment? All right, what's the best way to utilize this labor force?
and then it takes the actual labor. So uh, there's another concept here. I don't know if I really want to weave it in, but they're kind of linked, and that is the whole um, objection to employment on the grounds that, well, yeah, your boss is paying you all this money, but in return you have to work a lot. You've become a wage slave. Uh, and there's a couple problems with that, but the one I want to talk about mo mostly is that when, when you really analyze that statement, uh, what they're objecting to is the fact that you're getting something, but it's it's being given to you only conditionally. So my boss pays me money, but only on the condition that I work for him. And this is viewed as slavery. So a socialist wouldn't care if my boss just said, I'm just going to give you all this money for nothing. Um, the problem is that no society can function uh, without conditions, without conditional exchange. So, I mean, in a socialist society, you can't just be given things unconditionally. They may say, oh, if you're poor and you can't work, you'll get health care. That may be, but what about the people who provide the health care? Somebody, not everybody can have it be unconditional. Somebody's going to have to work to make that stuff happen. Have to work. If you receive services that require labor, then and you're guaranteeing that those goods and services be provided, then somebody doesn't have the option. Somebody can't unconditionally receive them. Somebody, somewhere, has to do it. And so socialist societies, I mean, a lot of them are just so uh, lazadaisical and, and empty-minded that they just assume that nobody will have to work. And I think the Venus Project people are really close to this, even though if you look at it, the Venus Project does actually say that 10% or something will have to work. But then you get to the more sophisticated socialists will say, well, of course, you'll, you have to work in a factory. You'll have to do something. You know, the, the, the beneficence of socialist world order are not unconditional. They require that you work, at least. In effect, they're going to require that you be obedient and that you work. And at the end of the day, for all intents and purposes, that you become a slave, an actual slave, like the kind that can't change his master or choose not to work as you would in a free market. Uh, so uh, the, I believe, defunct YouTube user, and I reg regrettably so, Brain Police 2 said it very well, the choice isn't between work for a boss or starve. The choice is between to act or to die. All of us must act to live. This is regardless of society. This is not something imposed on us by capitalism. This is something innate to nature to resist entropy, as uh, Butler Schaefer would say, we must act, we must do work in the strictest uh, physical sense. We must feed ourselves, we must act. The only way we couldn't is if we were vegetative. And there, of course, who's gonna say we could have a society based where everyone's vegetative? That just doesn't make any sense. You may still be alive, but your humanity would be very much in doubt at that point. So, uh, I have, I mean, right now my situation is actually looking very good. If, if everything happens the way it looks like it's going to, by the end of next week, I will have no debt at all. And all that gold and silver still. Uh, we'll see. But uh, I do think even though this is an anecdotal story, it is illustrative uh, of, of the principle that capitalists and entrepreneurs and employers do not have dictatorial power. They have to swoon their employees. Uh, they have to entice them to work for them. And the only way they can do that is to offer them something that they're willing to work for. You know, the minute the, the, what he offers is not what enough to do what I do, because what I do, I'm out here all the time. You know, I basically don't have a life other than you, my fellow subscribers. Uh, and if his remuneration isn't what I deem appropriate, I can just walk away and do something else. You know, the only thing that mandates that I have some kind of income is the fucking government who charges rent anywhere you want to live. I totally sympathize with those people who just want to go out and live in the woods, have a cabin, and be subsistence farmers. That would be awesome. Too bad Uncle Sam won't allow it. and forces you to have money to pay off the extortion to prevent you from going to prison. Other story entirely. Anyway, uh, I don't know when I will upload this. Perhaps in the next week or so, but that's it. Bye-bye.